totally disabled to examine any of these materials, have the ability to challenge them. And this was deliberate surprise to cause that result at a stage in the trial where continuance is no remedy, because that's punishing this jury, which has been punished enough. There is only one remedy for these violations, Your Honor, and that is preclusion. It would be totally unfair to stop this trial long enough to permit us to go through each one of these photos. Dr. Morton has seen the original, but he's had no basis to compare and see whether they're taken out of context, whether this is a piece of advocacy or a fair presentation. As to that photo in particular, it can never be anything else. The sources of blue fiber in California or the United States are infinite. And we will need to prove up and be able to cross-examine all the possible sources, particularly from the environment where these were taken. And that's going to take some time. And we could have done it had we been given any kind of decent notice. <clears throat> as far as the photos of the Bronco from various years, that was sprung on us today. Now, we've been checking carpet all over the United States very dutifully in an effort to represent this defendant in a responsible way, and at no time have we ever run across a notion that there is a periodic change? Had we been warned of that, we could have checked it out and either said, yes, that's correct, we won't take the court's time up with a meaningless challenge, or been able to cross-examine on the point as to when the changes were made, how many million yards of each fabric were created, what cars they were installed in, what houses, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> the last matter that I would like to take up, and it's one that is very disturbing and we've been waiting for it to erupt. The FBI book on hairs and fibers says very clearly that the most that can ever be said is that a hair or a fiber is similar to or cannot be eliminated from a same source, but can or never is, be identified. Consistent with. Yep. Consistent with is permissible. Match is never permissible and is a highly dangerous word because a lay jury looking at photos of hairs of ostensibly the same color with some similar characteristics may get the impression, if the wrong language is used, that this is an identification of the defendant when it's a far cry. There is not, Your Honor, even a database from which one could come up with frequencies, as is attempted to be done in DNA. No one knows how many people have hair that is indistinguishable from that on the hat or from that of the defendant. And for any hint to be given that this even comes close to an identification of the defendant's hair would be ground for a mistrial. And I would ask, Your Honor, if that happens, you strike all the testimony on hairs because the parties are forewarned. I do not expect there's been any change in FBI policy about the value of this evidence since this was published in 1977. If there is, none of us has heard about it. Nor did any of the literature ever go any further than this. And the use of the word match or the same as or any similar uh, articulation is simply deadly. If you, if you recollect, I, I think I was the one who noted that initially. Yes, I know, Your Honor. I heard the word in court today, and that's why I'm hoping that you enforce the rule very stridently. What we don't need at this point is a mistrial. Even if the defendant could not be tried again to prevent him from putting on his very strong case before this jury, this court, and this country, after suffering all these months, would be a greater injustice than if he was struck dead right this moment. All right, Mr. Bailey, so I understand the nature of your objection, since obviously I'm not privy to this information either. You're objecting to the bluish-black cotton photographs? Yes, sir. You're objecting to the photographs regarding the periodic change in Bronco carpet? Yes, sir. And you're objecting to what else? The hair elimination photos hair of elimination. the police officers and others who were on the scene. Those could have been given to us last December or no later than January. There's one final objection, Your Honor, <coughs> which I noted during the recess. You note that the chart on the dog hair comparisons compares three of Cato's hairs to the two gloves and suggests that Cato's hairs, or hairs similar to Cato's, consistent with, were found on both gloves. The last column suggests that a hair similar to Chachi was found on the Bundy glove. Now, that could be taken as having some significance if certain inferences were drawn. However, after that comparison was made and after the witness came to his conclusion that they were similar, he discovered by accident that there were many, many dog hairs in Ron Goldman's home, that they were similar 
to Chachi's, and those have not been mounted to give the jury an opportunity to look at that comparison. Because if Ron Goldman had dog hairs on his clothing, and they dragged Ron Goldman's body out and it touched the glove, that would certainly explain the presence of a dark hair, not Cato's. Obviously, Cato's hairs being on both gloves is not of great significance, but the Chachi one is. Now, we, we're reading from Mr. Diedrich's notes about his after discovery and about his comparison and about his statement that they're similar, and the failure to mount those should preclude that last column from coming before the jury. All right, thank you, Counsel. Ms. Clark? Uh, counsel's hyperbole notwithstanding, the photographs of which he complains concerning discovery were photographs taken for the sole purpose of creating an exhibit in court. The evidence itself was turned over to counsel long ago and on many occasions. Right, we're talking about the hair elimination photos, correct? Correct, as well as the photographs, as well as the um, blue, black, cotton fiber photographs. All of the evidence has been in the it has given, been given access to the defense on multiple occasions. With respect to the photographs of everything with the exception of the Elimination Standards Board and the blue, black, cotton fibers, those photographs were given over to Mr. Schulberg on September 27th. We received a phone call from Mr. Schulberg some minutes ago in which he informed us that no one from the defense team has called, them to, called him today, contrary to their representation to this court just a half an hour ago or so. He was sitting at home, and his phone has not rung. He is still at home and available for conversation. He is in possession of the photographs, all of the exception of which I've already noted to the court. Nevertheless, the photographs are not the evidence. The photographs are simply taken for the purpose of preparing exhibits in court. It is the court's order, in my understanding, that exhibits are to be shown to the defense the day before. We anticipated that cross of Susan Brockbank would take longer than it did, and we anticipated showing the defense all of the boards in their completed form at the close of business today with the idea that none of them would even begin to be used until tomorrow. That, the reason for that is that the boards had to be modified and changes needed to be made in labeling before they were complete. I wanted to be able to show the boards to defense in the manner in which we intended to present them in court so that any objections that we drew uh, would be based on what we we're actually intending to use as opposed to anything that needed to still be modified. So the boards were not even completed until this afternoon. Um, so with respect to the, the, these exhibits, and it is a, a complaint I understand from the defense about the exhibits, um, we will agree not to use the blue, black, cotton fiber board until tomorrow, and we will agree not to use the elimination standards board until tomorrow. And I think that that would bring us into compliance with the court's order. There was no willful desire to withhold this from defense. We didn't have it to present to them. It was only an exhibit. It's not evidence in and of itself. And so until the exhibit is prepared, we have nothing to show. With respect to the complaint counsel raises concerning the significance of the match between the blue, black, cotton fibers found on various items of evidence, that sounds like fertile uh, ground for cross-examination, but it does not sound like an objection that is legally sustainable in terms of preclusion of any of the evidence. Uh, and with respect, and I, I believe we will lay the foundation uh, for that, with Mr. Diedrich, he will indicate to the court why it is appropriate to declare a match between those uh, questioned fibers in his, ex in his experience and judgment. Is he going to say it's a match? Shall I ask him? Well, no, I assume you've interviewed him. I have, and we have used the term match. I have not specifically asked about that term because I did not think it would be objectionable because it's never going to be indicated to the jury um, that there's a match without also saying that he cannot rule out other hair type, other possible sources that have the same characteristics as the questioned hair or the exemplar hair, as the case may be. Um, there will be no time in which Mr. Diedrich will state a conclusion without that qualification. So there's not going to be any misleading to the jury. 
and, and the court is well aware that it is not my practice to put a, an expert on the witness stand or any witness on the witness stand to say something that is not forensically or legally defensible or appropriate. And I've never given counsel any reason to believe that I'm going to ask Mr. Diedrich to make a conclusion concerning identity on the hairs or the fibers. All right, well, let's, let's start from the top then. Okay. With regards to these photographs, that I have here to my left, the bluish black cotton fiber associations. Uh, with regards to these eight photographs, when were they, uh, when did they come to the possession of the prosecution? We never got the photographs, Your Honor. Mr. Diedrich prepared the board for us. You know what I mean? We weren't furnished with a stack of photographs. He brought a board in with him that we just completed the labeling on this afternoon. When were these photo when was when did Mr. Diedrich conduct this analysis with regards to the blue black cotton fiber? Ballpark. End of ninety four, perhaps. All right, and was is this information in the in his report that was given to the defense? Oh, yes. As, as was the evidence itself given to the defense. I mean, the defense has had the fibers as well as his reports and notes concerning all of the items that we're going to present. And do the notes indicate taking of photographs? No. Again, the photographs, however, Your Honor, are, are not taken for, the, for any purpose um, analytically speaking. They're not taken for the purpose of assisting Mr. Diedrich in his examinations or in forming any conclusions. The photographs are taken so solely to illustrate to the jury what it was he saw. It's solely a demonstrative exhibit. That's its only purpose. When did, you, when did the prosecution become aware of the existence of these photographs? I mean, the boards that I was aware of were the boards containing the defendant's known hair samples compared to the question hair no, samples. No, my, quest, my question but the is, blue -black? the blue-black, when were these photographs given to the prosecution? Well, the board was brought in to us. The first time I saw it was last week, and it was not uh, labeled appropriately. I asked that it be relabeled so that it would be more precise as to the source of everything. And that was completed today. I thought I understood the court's order concerning exhibits to be that it was to be presented to the defense the day before presentation in court. exhibits? Not regarding exhibits, but this is evidence. It's not just exhibits. Well, it's photographs of the evidence, but it's done. The photo, you know, the point here is, Your Honor, the photographs, the, the witness does not compare photographs. The witness compares the, uh, the fibers themselves. Mm -hmm. The photographs are only taken for the purpose of showing something to the jury for explanation and demonstrative purposes, for teaching. Well, I, I, don't, I really don't understand the problem here. You know, the defense no, has had the... No, counsel, the problem is this. You have a picture of a fiber from the Rockingham glove. You have a picture of a fiber from Mr. Goldman's shirt. You have a, two fibers that are similar that are found on Mr. Simpson's socks. I mean, obviously, and you've got a picture of Mr. Simpson on the evening in question wearing what appears to be dark blue or black clothing. And I suspect that you're going to argue from that 
that given the nature of the struggle between Mr. Goldman and the alleged assailant, and given the type of clothing that Mr. Simpson was wearing, you're going to argue, and given the fact that it's on the socks and it's on Mr. Goldman's shirt and it's on the right-hand glove, you're going to argue that this is fiber from the clothing of the assailant. Correct? Yes, Your Honor, right. I am. But and doesn't this fo don't these photographs demonstrate the similarity of the bl blue-black fiber? Well, yes, and the court has used the operative word demonstrate because I could make that argument to the jury mm -hmm. with the witness's testimony, which the court would not preclude because discovery of the conclusion reached by the witness concerning his examination of the evidence was, was timely furnished mm -hmm. to the defense, as were the fibers themselves timely furnished to the defense not once but four or five times. And so now the only thing we're talking about is the fact that the witness has prepared an exhibit for the jury to, de to graphically demonstrate what his testimony is going to give and which the defense has known about for months. All right. My question is, when were these photographs provided by the FBI to the prosecution? The photographs were mounted on a board by the FBI, and the board was brought in. I last saw it last week, Your Honor, in an incomplete form. And Mr. Diedrich, when were these photographs taken? And when were they provided to the prosecution? Well, the charts weren't sent until probably April, maybe, April or May. I believe all the charts that were prepared from the photographs. Uh, the last charts came in probably right around the 1st of June. All right, how about the uh, Bronco changes? Can I see that again, please? Mr. Fairlow? Now, again, these are not the photographs of the defendant's Bronco carpet. These are simply illustrative photographs of carpet fibers from the years 92 to 94. Well, 91 through 95. Taken for illustrative purposes in demonstrating differences between carpet fibers. Is mention of this made in uh, any of the reports prepared by Mr. Dietrich? Mention of the taking of photographs? Yes. I don't believe so. And when did these photographs come into the possession of the prosecution? Last week. <clears throat> and Mr. Dietrich, where did you get these photographs? Uh, they were taken in the laboratory. And these are samples provided by Ford Motor Company? Yes, they were. Did you write a report with regard to this? All right, how about the uh, hair elimination photos? When were those taken? When were those taken? Yes. It would have been in, de in December of 94. <coughs> and when were, they when were they transmitted to the prosecution? Again, all of the charts came at the same, about the same time. So that would be April or May? That's correct. All right, and the last thing is the objection regarding uh, the fact that the non-inclusion of another chachi hair, is that what the problem is? No, Your Honor, hairs from Goldman's home that look similar to chachi's, to Mr. Diedrich, according to his Got notes. It. All right, Ms. Uh, Clark, any comment on that? 
be the subject of expert testimony, Your Honor, and certainly since counsel is well aware of the facts of the uh, examinations conducted by Mr. Diedrich, it's subject to cross-examination. Mr. Diedrich has certain conclusions that he's drawn from what he has seen. The existence of other similar dog hairs that I believe, well, I don't know what Mr. Diedrich um, would say concerning that. Um, I had not determined whether I would even ask Mr. Diedrich about the uh, um, <clears throat> comparison of the Chachi hairs. I have shown all of the boards that we have mm -hmm. without the intention necessarily of introducing all of them before the jury. The reason that all right, let me ask you just a, a factual question. The representations from Goldman, was this from Mr. Goldman's apartment or from the Goldman residence in? Uh, the apartment. The apartment. His apartment, yes. All right. Okay. Let me also indicate this to the court. I had no I, I did not know what boards had been sent in because I'm in one place and they came into another. But it wouldn't have mattered had I known because I needed to interview Mr. Diedrich and see what, if any, boards I wanted to use. And those interviews did not begin until, I mean, I, I spoke to him a long time ago in general about all of our evidence in this case. But that was before he'd even taken a lot of these photographs. When we really sat down to prepare for his testimony, it was last week and a little bit the week before. And it was only last week, after having gone through his, what he would testify to, that I began to look at the boards to see what, if any of them, that he prepared that we wanted to use. At this point, I've been over-inclusive and shown everything with the idea in mind that not necessarily all of it would be used. But I didn't want to take any chances knowing that you know, we have to produce these boards a day in advance. And in what, case aren't, we, what aren't you going to use at this time? Well, what I, I had seriously considered not using the dog hair comparisons board. Um, I hadn't even made a final determination as to whether or not I would ask Mr. Diedrich about the Chachi hairs. All right. Uh, in, the, in the scheme of things, that's probably the least of my concerns here. Mm -hmm. With respect to the... But I'm, I'm more concerned about the fact that this blue-black cotton fiber, I mean, I can see the demonstrative purpose for this. It's pretty clear. To say that the photograph is not evidence is not a, not a credible argument. Um, the fact that these photographs were taken in the end of 94 um, and that they were delivered to the prosecution sometime in April or May, that would trigger the obligation to, to turn copies of those photographs over if the people intend on using evidence of blue-black cotton uh, fibers. Well, Your Honor, but the... As to the uh, hair elimination, the fact that these photographs were taken in December of 94 and transmitted to the prosecution in April or May, and if there's a reason, I mean, if there's evidence in this case, they should have been turned over to, to the defense. But, Your Honor, I, you know, th there's a real distinction to be made here. The witness made an examination and a comparison, and his conclusions and all of his examinations and notes were turned over to the defense in a timely fashion. That's the evidence. The fact that he took right, photographs. that's the evidence, then you don't need the photographs. The photographs are an assistance. They're a demonstrative tool, as the defense has been using them and springing them on us at the last minute as well. And we've had, we've had numerous occasions to object to the defense withholding their demonstrative exhibits till the very last minute. But we were not attempting to do that in this case. I didn't even know what I was going to use until a few days ago, and I didn't know what final form it would take until I, all of the corrections were made. And I did not intend to have to use them even think about using them until tomorrow because the cross-examination did not take as long as I thought it would. All right, I'm not, I'm not as concerned about the one-day rule as far as turning over exhibits, but I am concerned about the failure to turn over photographs. There are clearly evidence. I don't care what you call them. All right, any other comment? Bailey. 
three points, Your Honor. First, <coughs> Mr. Newfeld did place a call to Mr. Schulberg. The dial his number, got no answer. I'm sure I'm you're not, not terribly about concerned about that, but I want the record to be straight. Number two, to exacerbate the situation, more than a month ago, I went to Ms. Clark and said, for my purpose, I would like to shorten down, wherever possible, the presentation of expert evidence, and I know there's a lot of it. Could we get together and go over what it is you want to present? She put that on the record. I was watching her on television when she told you, said we were going to do that. So this all could have been avoided. Furthermore, these pictures that were handed to us at 245 aren't worth much without the labels. If we can't see the board speaking to the jury, we don't know what the board's going to say. And they certainly could have given us fair warning about this and give us an opportunity to answer it on Mr. Diedrich's cross. And we don't have that opportunity now, and preclusion is the only fair remedy. The suggestion that these are not evidence flies in the face of the evidence code. They are evidence because if you're not going to admit them as evidence, the jury should never see them. And the suggestion that because we saw the fibers through a microscope, we're not harmed by these photos popping up, is specious. That's like saying because you visited the crime scene, you're not entitled to see the photos of the crime scene we intend to put in evidence. Your Honor would never buy that, and yet it's the same story. Thank you. you know, that, 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 Mr. Bailey raises a very, the very point I'm trying to make. They have seen the fibers themselves. They have seen the notes and the conclusions of the witness. They could take their own photographs as well. Nothing has been precluded them at all. The only thing that we have done is to graphically depict what they already know to be the case in terms of the witness's testimony and his conclusions. They're not taken by surprise, but in no way are they surprised by the fact that Mr. Diedrich has made the conclusions that are depicted on this board. And that's really the bottom line. There is not surprise. Now they can see the photographs. All right, they can see the photographs, but they know what the conclusions are. And Mr. Bailey and I spoke about shortening down the testimony and that concerned Denise Lewis and Susan Brockbank I told him what I was going to elicit from Mr. Diedrich, and that has not changed. I have not misrepresented to him what he would be testifying to. I was not aware of all the boards that were possible to be used at the time we spoke. As soon as they were corrected and re ready to be shown to the defense, they, they are shown. The defense has ample time now and to the conclusion of business today and even into tomorrow to examine the photographs and get advice from their experts as to how to handle them on cross-examination. Because the bottom line for cross-examination is not the photographs, Your Honor. The, cro the cross-examination will go to the substance of the testimony and the weight and power and force to be given those conclusions concerning question fibers that have no known standard to be compared to. And the photographs aren't going to change that cross-examination any at all. And that's the bottom line. That's why what you're doing is simply preventing the jury from understanding better what the witness is talking about. That that's what the court is basically going to do if it precludes the use of the photographs. But, it will not, but in allowing the use of the photographs, it won't change counsel's cross-examination. His cross-examination has to remain the same. Because the conclusions were known to him, the, ground, the groundwork is laid for what the cross has to be. The existence or non-existence of photographs does not change that cross-examination in any way, shape, or form. And that's what matters in terms of the right to be prepared. All right, thank you. Well, there's an old Chinese saying that a picture is worth a thousand words. There's no other reason to present these photographs other than to use it as clearly evidence of the uh, fiber evidence that we have here in the other comparisons. And to argue that it's not evidence is, is a specious argument. All right, the objection to the uh, first objection was to the uh, Atlas first two objections were to the Atlas uh, photos regarding various types of fibers. Uh, those objections will be overruled. Those are general demonstrative exhibits. And uh, I think counsel is well prepared to deal with those. As to the uh, dog hair fiber, excuse me, the dog hair comparison board, I think the fact that the chart does not include dog hairs that were later found at uh, Mr. Goldman's apartment and that those dog hairs at Mr. Goldman's apartment are 
comparable to those from the dog Chachi. Um, I don't think that's an objection to preclude the use since uh, the prosecution uses it without that information at their peril since the obvious argument will be that uh, by not including it they're attempting to hide something or not providing a complete picture. As to the Bronco comparison, the, uh, they appear to be electron, mic electron microscope pictures of those fibers. I will overrule the objection to their use. However, the prosecution may not use those until the defense has had time to uh, conduct any additional investigation that they need to conduct. It appears to the court that an obvious area of inquiry would be to the Ford Motor Company to ask them about the types of fibers that are installed in the Broncos um, and whether or not that changes over time, whether or not there's any uniqueness to the uh, source. Since these photographs were made available to the prosecution only last week, um, and because this information was available to either side, uh, anybody could have picked up the phone and called Dearborn and gotten this information. Uh, I don't find a violation there. Uh, I am much more troubled, however, by the uh, hair elimination photos and the blue-black cotton, blue cotton fiber photos. I have to take into consideration the fact that uh, the defense did have in its possession Mr. Diedrich's reports regarding the comparisons and in fact had access to the samples themselves. However, the photographs are an important part of that analysis. And what I will do is since the defense has their counsel here, has their expert here, has the photographs with their markings here. I'm going to recess this matter until tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. I'm going to direct the prosecution to make all of these exhibits available to the defense overnight. They can examine those. If that is still not adequate time to prepare and to compare the reports with those fibers, then I'll consider other sanctions. As I would like to finish this case sometime this lifetime. I would certainly object to Mr. Diedrich testifying that the Ford Motor Company told him something. I think that's inadmissible hearsay. Well, that's another issue. I understand, but I would suggest, in order to expedite matters, that Mr. Diedrich make known to us who his sources were so we can cut to the quick and try and get this trial back on the road. And I agree. I also hope that you will make a ruling on the word match. I'm very troubled about that. As am I. I think I've already indicated my concern with that, but it depends on what the foundation is. Maybe something miraculous has happened but Mr. Diedrich's reputation is well known, and I don't think we're going to see anything strange. I don't think. I should hope not. All right. Do you want me to say something? No. 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 I'm not worried about that. That's a non issue. All right. I'm going to order the prosecution to, make all, to leave all of these boards here in the courtroom. We're going to recess until tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. Um, I'm going to direct the Sheriff's Department to allow the defendant and his counsel to remain in the courtroom with the exhibit so that they can review these matters. And we'll start tomorrow morning fresh at 9 o'clock, but we'll see where we are. If I may, I offer to the defense the ability to confer with Mr. Diedrich. No, I, I was about to do that, too. Okay. I'm going to order Mr. Diedrich to remain to consult with the defense counsel and ask, answer any questions that they have of him. All right. Uh, would you take the exhibit down, please? Let's have the jurors, please. Mr. Fairlow, would you move the uh, easel?
All right, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon again. My apologies to you again for the delay in getting started with uh, the next witness's testimony. Certain things came up that I needed to discuss with the lawyers, and uh, it's taken us uh, obviously more time than I had anticipated. Some other things have come up that I need to deal with that I'm going to have to do out of your presence, so I thought I'd call you out, let you all go home for the day, and uh, we'll try to start again tomorrow morning fresh uh, at 9 o'clock. Please remember all of my admonitions to you. Don't discuss the case amongst yourselves. Form any opinions about the case. Conduct any deliberations until the matter has been submitted to you. Nor are you to allow anybody to communicate with you with regard to the case. Have a nice evening. See you tomorrow morning, 9 o'clock. All right. And I'll see counsel as soon as we... We cannot instruct the witness not to prepare a report. Mr. Harmon knows that Dr. Mullis has testified in other cases, and there were never any reports prepared in those other cases as well uh, by Dr. Mullis. But when Dr. Mullis read this paragraph, he asked me, or there was, a, there was a, he was concerned that perhaps he had violated some law, uh, and that's what uh, Mr. Harmon was accusing him of, uh, because he had not prepared a report in this matter. Um, obviously, he's not a lawyer. Obviously, discovery requested to be made to counsel, uh, not to the witnesses themselves, um, just in its entirety. And, and I'm, I'm not even suggesting that, that, that there was any ill intent on the part of Mr. Harmon. But when you look at the record of what's happened in this case with respect to uh, uh, Dr. Mullis and what Mr. Harmon has said and, and what he did with other witnesses, in particular Dr. Reedus, all I'm asking the court to do is simply um, ask Mr. Harmon to uh, stop communicating with Dr. Mullis. Um, and uh, if he has any requests to make, they can be made through me as counsel. Um, and uh, other communication will happen when and if uh, Dr. Mullis testifies in this case. Thank you. Mr. Harmon. Sure. I, I'd like to clear up the revisionist history that Mr. Sh uh, Neufeld has, has constructed out about, about what's happened in this case. I made a disparaging comment about Dr. Mullis, and if you revisit that, that was an inappropriate response by me to inappropriate garbage that Professor Thompson injected into this record when you interrupted him and you reprimanded him for the kinds of personal attacks that he made on me. That's well, the, let's, that's let's the, not that's the, no, that's the, well, that's the reality of what happened. So I can't, let's I'm not, not going to. revisit that. Well, I, I'm responding to the revisitation and the reconstruction by, by Mr. Neufeld. And I, I think I have a right to do that, Your Honor, because that, that's not what happened. Okay? Um, Dr. Mullis says this is harassing it. I, I want to read the letter. Okay? I want to read everything that I sent to him. Well, Mr. Harmon, I do have the letter dated June 21st, 1995 before me, and I have read the letter. Well, you know, people are going to think he's telling the truth about what he said about what's in the letter when that's not what the letter contains. If Dr. Mullis feels harassed by, by a request to talk to him, the Nobel Prize winner, about stuff he's been blabbing all over the world on, on every tabloid that would invite him, and I think you should question Mr. Neufeld about that representation. Well, counsel, I assume that you have uh, videotapes of all of those uh, interviews, and that will be ample fodder for your cross-examination. The only issue I'm concerned about is that it's clear to the court from our discussions that Dr. Mullis is an expert with uh, substantial credentials, uh, who has been retained as an expert to consult with the defense. As such, uh, he is somebody who is, I, I assume, from the representation from Mr. Neufeld, uh, consulting with them in the preparation and presentation of whatever defense they choose to present. As such, uh, the court's concern, obviously, as I indicated in my ruling of May 27th, is the invasion of that relationship between counsel and the expert witness, which is their work product, and it's protected by the attorney-client privilege. That, 
That's in a nutshell, Your Honor, and I'd be happy to address that right now. All right. That's the issue. That is the issue. It's the only issue. All the rest of those things are, are attempts to uh, inject irrelevant material in here. And just so the record is straight, I'll make this letter of June 21st, which includes the letter of February 2nd, which includes a transcript from another case, two pages of a transcript. I'll make that a court's exhibit number one for the purpose of this hearing so your record is full. Sure. I, I, I would appreciate that, Your Honor. Um, the court mentioned your order of May 27th. I, I think, and I invite the court, I'm not asking you to rewrite that, Your Honor, but I, I'd I'd like you to consider this point, which, which applies to this very situation, too. Unbeknownst to me, when I contacted Dr. Readers, who was the subject of your court order, in fact, he was a defense expert. He was listed on the October, I can't recall the date, I have it here, a defense expert list. And that's a, that's a critical point. And, and I really invite the court to reread your order about my reprehensible conduct in light of the argument or, or the overwhelming authorities in this state, because that is a controlling issue. Um, can the prosecution contact an expert who is on the witness list, who, as Mr. Neufeld said, will testify? You characterize him a little differently. You said he's consulting with them. Of course, he does that in leading up to it, but he will testify. That's the only reason he's on the witness list. That's to appease us that they can't sandbag us with his sudden appearance, but they can sandbag us with the content of his testimony and not provide a report. So can we contact an expert on the witness list who has publicly expressed his intent to testify in numerous, numerous media interviews? Now, I think there's a couple of subcategories to that that apply to this case that help you really focus on what the issue is. Does the fact that no expert report has been filed by that person, does that somehow undermine our ability, legal ability, to interview that witness? Or put another way, if he had given us an expert report, would we be able to talk to him about the content of the expert report or the notes? We've gotten few notes from Dr. Lee. It is my position. To, to point out the, the, the difference between Dr. Lee and Dr. Mullis and, and, and argue that there's no legal distinction, that we can contact Dr. Lee. The only reason they've given us those notes is because that's what he intends to testify about. Now, certainly, we should be able to interview him ahead of time about the content of his notes. And the fact that you have allowed them to not turn over reports that are by saying, well, we don't, we're not going to write them, we haven't, we haven't told them not to, should that undermine our ability to interview a witness that we would be legally entitled to interview had he, in fact, written a report or had he written notes? And of course, there's no legal distinction between those two categories. So should we be able to do less by interviewing him and contacting him because the thing that has triggered our ability to do it is the fact that they've listed him as a witness. It's plain and simple. They have met, he will testify. We must recall that the reason be be behind Prop 115 under 1054A was to promote the ascertainment of truth in trials by requiring timely pretrial discovery to say nothing about all the saving of court time about hashing these things out ahead of time. So we haven't been given anything. We're not entitled to contact those people. Well, the overwhelming authority in California clearly makes the distinction that Mr. Neufeld seems to be unaware of, and that is, and this is in both criminal cases and in civil cases, that once that per it is made clear that that person will testify, the work product privilege no longer applies. And the cases that stand for that proposition are 
Uh, interestingly, one that the defense injected when Professor Thompson was here, County of Los Angeles versus Superior Court, 222 Calab 3rd, 647, at page 654, as well as Shadow Traffic Network versus Superior Court, 24 Calab 4th, I'm sorry, Twenty-four Calab Fourth, six ninety-nine, as well as National Steel Products Company versus Superior Court, one sixty-four Calab Third, five thirty. I'm sorry, two ten California Reporter. I've got a mixture of different reporters here. Page five thirty-six. And, and a case that uh, we cited for the proposition that they should be forced to turn over reports whether or not they exist, Woods versus Superior Court, um, 25 Calab 4th, 188. And those cases all stand for the proposition that once you make it clear that that witness will testify, the work product privilege no longer applies. And, and isn't that analogous to the situation that compels them to list a witness that they intend to call at the trial under 1054.3? The only reason Dr. Mullis is on the witness list is if they intend to call him at the trial. That's why they had to list him. Now, you have allowed them not to turn over any material that exists in any form. Uh, and I don't intend to re-argue that. We had an extensive hearing on Friday afternoon about that. Um, now, if they want to invoke the work product privilege, there's a simple remedy for them. Take them off the witness list. But if they take them off the witness list, they can't testify. By the court's ruling on Friday, and what they seek to do today, by overextending the ruling that you made in a different context that I, I sincerely ask you to reconsider now that I pointed out that Dr. Readers was listed as of October. Um, they have listed those people and once they are listed, we should be entitled to communicate them. If you, if you allow them to get away with what happened on Friday as well as impose this kind of limitation on us your order of May 27th specifically said the harm that's involved in contacting one of these experts is the unintentional disclosure of work product privilege. And if you read those cases, that privilege does not apply because they have listed them on, on their witness list. So the harm that you perceived at that point, not realizing that even Dr. Readers was on that witness list clearly does not apply with Dr. Mullis. He's been on their witness list for quite some time. And, and mistakenly on my part, and I'd suggest to the court, should not apply to, to the order that you made on May 27th. One of the things that the court seemed to recognize that is nowhere in any of the uh, 1054 sections and I would hope the court doesn't intend to apply it in this context about invoking or losing the work product privilege. I think the court described some sort of fluidity exception because of the dynamics of a trial and, and issues evolving and some things being important and then disappearing. Um, and that perhaps the defense could change their mind at the last minute about the nature of the testimony of any of these experts. Now, that's nowhere in any of these cases that, that interpret 1054, and it's certainly not in any of the um, uh, ballot information about Prop 115. I would hope that you wouldn't do the same here, because if you do, if you allow them to say, you know, he's on the witness list, he's done a lot of things for us, but until they rest, we're not really sure what he's going to testify about because we need to see the full content of their case. Well, first off, that denies us the right to a fair trial that, that 1054 describes. It's going to waste an awful lot of the court time when, when we litigate these witnesses one by one. But just imagine other subcategories of this fluidity exception. Just imagine we have the indecisive defense attorney who says, you know, I have these alternative theories, Your Honor. 
but I can't, I just can't decide which one to advocate until I flip a coin or I talk to my wife about it. So until that happens, I'm invoking the work product privilege because I haven't decided which areas of his testimony I intend to present. Or just imagine the alcoholic defense attorney who's in a drunken stupor all the time and because he's never sober, can't make a rational decision until he sobers up. Under this fluidity exception that seems to have been applied, I can't conceive of any reason any defense attorney would ever turn over any material under the reciprocal discovery provisions that were enacted by the voters under Prop 115. To do so under this newly recognized fluidity exception would be incompetent for any defense attorney. 1054 once again promotes the ascertainment of truth and it's supposed to do that in advance of the trial. That's all we want. It's the same voters who vote for all elected officials that voted overwhelmingly in support of Proposition 115. They've been, the defense has not been forced to comp comply with what we believe the appropriate construction of 1054.3 is, and we intend to pursue that ourselves by talking to these witnesses ahead of time. I believe that when you read the letter and the transcript of Dr. Mullis, this is his idea. This was his suggestion that he testified about in a case in November where it would save an awful lot of time to have the scientists get together ahead of time. I cannot imagine what has happened to him since November that would cause him to change his mind. I invited him to, to identify the issues I would have all the appropriate scientists there. We would sit down and discuss it so that we could focus on real issues and not the illusory issues that have been injected into this case. Furthermore, if we are denied the opportunity to have contact with those experts, which we're legally entitled to do, to seek to have that kind of a discussion with them, then we will never be able to elicit the fact that they have declined to do so, which I believe we're legally entitled to do. So uh, with those comments, Your Honor, I'd like you to read those cases and realize the work product privilege ceased to exist the instant they submitted that witness list. The harm that you perceived concerning the contacts that ha I had with Dr. Readers, which I think when you see the, the, ex the uh, witness list that was in existence long before I ever contacted him, you will realize that legally we are entitled to have those contacts with them. Legally, they are entitled to refuse to talk to us, and legally, we are entitled to elicit their refusal from them should they, in fact, testify in this case. Thank you. I'm not going to revisit those issues because obviously uh, Dean Ullman and um, uh, dealt with those last week and they were resolved by the court. There, there is no legal right that gives the prosecutor um, the ability to send a letter to a witness basically demanding a report from him suggesting that the failure to turn over report may be a violation of California law uh, and trying to intimidate him into speaking with the prosecution. All I'm simply saying here, Your Honor, is that in light of what's, this is not on a clean slate, um, I'm simply asking uh, that since it has been communicated to me uh, by Dr. Mullis that he regards Mr. Harmon's efforts as harassment and the efforts of the prosecution in this case as harassment, that they cease and desist from communicating with him, either by telephone or in the mail or any other means of communication. If they have something that they wish to communicate, they can do it through counsel. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Mr. Uh, Harmon, the prosecution is ordered to direct any communication to uh, Dr. Mullis through uh, defense counsel. Anything else? Could, Your Honor, could, could we consider my letter to Dr. Mullis a request for an interview? Yes. Thank you. All right, we'll stand in recess. The Sheriff's Department is to make Mr. Simpson available. Uh, Mr. Diedrich is to remain. People's exhibits, uh, photo exhibits are to remain. All right. All right, we'll be in recess.